Hello and welcome to the Napoleon Assist and another reviews special. Today I want to bring you a review on a book that is possibly one of the most important to have been published in 2017, reintroducing an often neglected topic that is vitally important. It is this authoritative and engaging work, George Ward's Wellington's headquarters. Historians have long since acknowledged that war is rarely if ever glorious. The popular perception of conflict is of heroic deeds, bold actions and daring strategies. And whilst those can and do have a dynamic role to play in the outcome of a campaign, in truth it is the more mundane issues of supply and administration that have the biggest impact on an army and its ability to fight effectively on the battlefield. It's for that reason that George Ward's 1957 publication, Wellington Headquarters, is so important. Wellington was a phenomenal administrator. He had a staggeringly complex grasp of the minutiae of military organization. And that's a fact that's attested to really by his voluminous correspondence and general orders. However, it's only on reading Ward's authoritative work that it's possible to comprehend the true extent of not only Wellington's ability as an administrator, but also the wider network of individuals who assisted him in making the British Army such a cohesive force in the Peninsula War. It was also, it was always therefore a huge pity that Ward's work was not more widely known outside of academic circles, a fact which was largely attributable to the difficulty in getting a copy because it had been so long since original publication. As a result, Pen and Sword's decision to reprint this crucial work is a welcome one. And this book, as I say, was possibly the most important publication uh, on the British Army during the Napoleonic era to come out in that year. Roy Muir has actually been the driving force behind efforts to bring this vital piece of work back into the mainstream. And it's therefore fitting that he is the one who introduces the reprinted version by bringing his own historiographical knowledge to bear in a short foreword. It's also pleasing that Rory has resisted the temptation to edit or annotate the work in light of more recent research, which has deepened our understanding of the topic. Instead, he's chosen to let Ward's work which speak for itself, which I think is a wise decision, because ultimately the greatest credit for this book must go to the original author. Ward wrote in a generally engaging style that reflects the careful thought of a man who understood how to make a complex topic both interesting and accessible. At times, he shows wit and an eye for the pertinent quotes, which amply demonstrate his points. It has to be acknowledged that at times the information is a little dry. Now, that's largely due to the fact that Ward is disseminating a huge amount of information on a very complex topic. Um, and admittedly, the workings of administration are something that might not always appeal to those who are looking for stories of glory. Now, that suggestion of dryness is probably most true in the opening chapter, um, where Ward's, beyond that, however, when the book progresses, Ward's writing style becomes increasingly evident. Um, and there are points where he's able to break off from the description to engage in the analysis and historiographical debate, which are intellectually stimulating. Furthermore, even in the driest sections of the work, it's difficult not to be impressed by the depth of Ward's knowledge and the ease with which he communicates this to the reader. It could also be uh, argued that Ward takes too favorable a view to members of the Adjutant General and Commissariat Department, seeking to defend the reputations of those who are often considered to have been incompetent in their jobs. However, this is not really the place for historical debate. And I would suggest that it's really for the reader to decide whether or not they are convinced by Ward's arguments. The only other point of criticism that I would raise is the issue of translations. Ward used both French and German comments over the course of his work without providing translations. Now in doing that, he was very much a product of his time, writing in the 1950s, when it was assumed that academics would be able to translate those phrases at will. In that sense, it might have been useful when taking this to a mass audience, as Pen and Sword have now done, to somehow make little additions of the translations um, in order to make it that little bit more accessible for those who aren't 
fluent in multiple languages. The one welcome addition that has been made to this book is a series of black and white plates containing images of both individuals and scenes from the Peninsula War. And that helps to set a lot of Ward's comments into context and is a pleasant addition to the original work. The single greatest impression that readers will receive from this book, frankly, is one of a huge amount of knowledge gained. It's a work that needs to be read at a moderate pace in order to fully appreciate and absorb all of the detail that can be taken from it. I was reading this book for, I think, the third time whilst putting together this review, and I found myself picking up fresh pieces of information and things that I'd forgotten, such as the depth and the value of it. On the whole, scholars of the Peninsula War will ignore this publication at their own peril. Roy Muir and Pen and Sword should be congratulated for their efforts to bring an exceptionally important but little known work back into the mainstream. Ultimately, there can be no greater testament to the value of George Ward's Wellington's headquarters than the fact that 60 years after its first publication, it has returned to the world's bookshelves, reasserting Ward's well-deserved place in the historiography of the Peninsula War. That's it for this reviews episode. A quick disclaimer, I am not sponsored by any publishing companies and I don't receive any money from the publishers to review this book or any others that feature on this podcast. The opinions I give you are quite simply my own, but I have a rule that if I can't be positive about a book, I don't go public with my reviews. There are some that I read and I'm a bit kind of skeptical, uh, but I'm not in the business of tearing people down. For that reason, I also don't take requests from authors to review books for this podcast because it could get potentially a little awkward. Thank you to everyone who takes the time to like, share and retweet. Please do leave a review and follow by your preferred podcast platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit that subscribe button and the notification bell below. It all helps to spread the word and keep you updated. I also want to take a moment to thank those of you who are showing incredible generosity by supporting this podcast on Patreon. If you're not already a patron and are interested in finding out a little bit more about what's involved, there is a link in the description and patrons do get some neat little perks like having their names in the credits and being able to influence future content. Tiers start from £1 a month, which I know is still a big ask, but it all helps to cover the overheads of production and in time should help me to increase the amount of content that I produce for you all. I therefore make no apologies in giving a shout out to my patrons who, at the time of recording, were Rob Griffith, Alex Churchill, Frida Seddon, Brendan Teeling, John Haynes, Anna Vakulenko, Beatrice de Graaf, Lynn Dawson and Jamie Kingston. Until next time, I'm Zach White. This has been a review special from The Napoleon Assist. Take care of yourselves, my friends. Stay well, stay safe. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you.